Welcome to your NCFE Level 2 Certificate in Principles of Team Leading, Session 3 of 4. In this session, we will look at understand how to deliver customer service and resolve problems, and understand how to develop working relationships with colleagues. My name is Phil Church, and I shall be your narrator and guide for this session. This NCFE Level 2 Online Certificate in Principles of Team Leading course is brought to you by Potl Harker and Solutions Equinox Training Solutions for Online Learning. The units being covered in this session are Understand how to deliver customer service and resolve problems and Understand how to develop working relationships with colleagues. Now, completing your assignments, it's important for you to understand the action verbs in the assignment questions. And the action verbs are these. Define. Your answer must give the precise meaning of a word. Describe. In order to describe something, you must give a detailed account of it. Explain. You need to ensure that your answer is clear, really revealing relevant facts. Identify. Point out and explain. Your answer should establish who or what something is. Please don't just provide a list. Give us some detail behind your findings as well. We will tutor you throughout the program and help you to complete the two assignments. Once you submit your assignments online, they will be assessed. All your completed assignments will then be submitted for internal and external quality assurance. And once this process is complete, you'll be awarded your qualification. Through our remote assistance service, we can be contacted at learners at solutionsequinox.com. And as stated before, please mark your email subjects as NCFE Leadership. But what does your journey for learning look like? Well, in session one, we looked at principles of team leading and followed by an online teaching support session. And in the second session, we look to understand business and understand how to communicate work-related information. And from then on, you should have gone on to complete your online assessment one. In this session, which is the first session of your second assignment, so session three of four, we will understand how to deliver customer service and resolve problems, and understand how to develop working relationships with colleagues. And following this session, there'll be an online teaching support session. And in the final session, we will look at introduction to coaching, introduction to mentoring, and understand personal development followed by an online teaching support session. And then you'll be able to go on to complete assignment two. And as always, you will see full tutor support throughout the program. And then you'll go on to receive your qualification. So in this section, we will look at understand customer service delivery. And to do that, we will explain the relationship between customer needs and expectations and customer satisfaction. And describe the features and benefits of an organization's products and services. Explain the importance of treating customers as individuals. Explain the importance of balancing the promises made to customers with the needs of an organization. Explain when and to whom to escalate problems and describe methods of measuring their own effectiveness in the delivery of customer service. The relationship between customers' needs and expectations and customer satisfaction. Customer expectations are governed by customer needs. In plain English, a customer approaches a business or your internal department 
with a specific need for a product or service. From this specific need comes a specific expectation. Customer needs and expectations are directly linked to customer satisfaction. Therefore, when a customer approaches a high-end vehicle brand, they expect to pay premium prices for a premium product, and there is an expectation that they will receive a commensurate premium customer service and experience. If customer needs and expectations are met, satisfaction will be high. But as the JD Power survey in 2019 for UK Vehicle Dependability Study shows that for car manufacturers on the right, customer needs and expectations are not always matched by satisfaction levels. As you can see, several premium brands have performed poorly. There are of course a number of factors including sales volumes which affect results, however, the results should be worrying for premium brands. If you look at some of the ones being circled here, such as Volvo, Volkswagen, Mercedes-Benz, Land Rover, Jaguar, and right the way through down to BMW, all of these are premium vehicle brands or consider themselves to be premium vehicle brands and they're virtually towards the bottom in fact, BMW is at the bottom of the JD Power survey. And that should be worrying for the premium brand because they're trying to sell a premium product. Therefore, if customer needs and expectations are not met, satisfaction will be low. So, your assignment question for question one is asking you to explain the relationship between customers' needs and expectations and customer satisfaction. So remember, customer needs are what the customer is looking for a product or service to do. Customer needs drive customers' expectations. And if a customer needs and expectations are met, they will be satisfied and results will be high. If they aren't, the customer will be dissatisfied and it will end up being low. Further reading can be found on pages four to seven of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. Each customer is unique, so treat them as such. So here's some important things to remember. Remember that each customer is unique. Each customer should feel important to the organisation. The customer feels that their problem has been heard and understood. The customer feels that action will be taken to find a solution to their problem. Increases customer trust in an organisation. You have lifelong customers and those lifelong customers will attract new customers because word will spread of how good you are. And if you're poor in your service, word will spread of just how poor you are. In these days of product services and recommendations and things like Trustpilot and all of the online review systems that you can have, your poor customer service could be online within seconds and read by thousands. However, provide good customer service and your product and service recommendations will be recommended across all people and you will attract more people into your company. Practice active listening. Really understand and listen to what's being said and empathise with the customer. You know, understand their feelings. Identify their need and tailor any needs and responses and actions whether the customer is actually always right is a matter for debate. Incidentally, do you know who coined this phrase, the customer is always right? It was actually Marks and Spencer. So, question two is asking you to explain the importance of treating customers as individuals. So it's important to treat customers as individuals so that staff can do their best to meet or exceed each customer 
particular needs and expectations. Some parts of the service offer will appeal to some people and not others. So team members need to be able to target their approach in line with the individual requirements. Another important reason is that organisations need to comply with anti-discrimination legislation, particularly the Equality Act 2010. And by treating customers as individuals, customer service can be enhanced and more effective with benefits including more accurate identification of customer needs and expectations, an increased customer satisfaction, improved customer relationships and loyalty, compliance with legislation and a good reputation for the organisation, plus, plus many more. And further reading can be found on pages 7 to 9 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. Features and benefits of products. Benefits, what are the advantages of a product or service? When Solutions Equinox Limited entered into an agreement to deliver your qualification, we were able to offer a product or service which brought benefits for the customer, in this case Poplar Harker. Solutions Equinox were able to design all the training material required to teach the qualification, teach the qualification and assess the qualification, which is known as a combination of products and services. As all elements required to deliver this qualification were being offered by one supplier, this brought cost savings and a one-stop source. So benefits again. In some instances, benefits are more important to customers than product features. So you can receive discounts on multiple purchases, for example. So for some of the benefits, affordability, low running costs, safety or prestige are some of the things that customers want from their products. Some features, characteristics, attributes and qualities of a product or service, colour, size, ease of use. And the features suggest how a product or service will provide its benefits. Think of car production. And if you think of car production, think of the different models within a car range. Take a Ford Focus, for example, when you have the base model and then you have the Titanium X right at the very top with sat-nav, heated seats, touchscreen controls and, and voice control systems. These are all the different features that are there that will provide a benefit to a product. Essentially, at the heart of it, the base model car and the top of the range model car are essentially the same product. It's just this other version has more features. And the features may help customers choose one product or service over another. Question three is asking you to describe the features and benefits of an organization's products and or services. So refer to products and services that's offered by your organization. If your organisation do not, does not offer goods or services or products, then think of a well-known organisation that you either use or research one that you can think of. And further reading can be found on pages 4 to 10 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. Balancing promises to customers with the needs of the organisation. You may wish to go the extra mile to give good customer service, however, know what offers, if any, you are authorised to make. Are you authorised to make those promises? If not, find out from somebody who can and will authorise to make those offers. Don't overpromise. Don't promise what you cannot deliver. Know that you can deliver whatever it is you are offering and this is basic good customer service. Keep your customers informed. Let customers know about changes or updates to their order. Give customers regular updates to let them know that you are working on their issue. Again, this is also basic customer service. Follow through on actions. 
and apologize, even if it's not you that's made the mistake, but somebody else within your company or your organization has made the mistake that's affected your customer, you are representing your company, organization, your department. Make an apology on behalf of your organization. This is good, this is basic customer service. And fully understand the organization's terms and offers and ask yourself, Again, are you authorised to make those promises? Because if those promises are not authorised, you're going to make your customer extremely upset. Question four is asking you to explain the importance of balancing problem promises to customers with the needs of an organisation. When organizations products and produce their service offer and make promises to customers, they need to make sure that their own needs are also met. An organization has many functions and requirements and it needs to achieve its own objectives to survive and thrive. For example, needs that should be considered include the supply chain, resources, budgets, compliance and compl compliance with legislation, policies, procedure and reputation. The main rule is that staff should only promise what can be delivered. False promises lead to disappointment for the customer or a serious consequence for the organisation. Further reading can be found on pages 14 to 15 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. When things don't go right, when should you escalate a problem? Well, make sure you've tried everything you know of to resolve the problem. You've reached a point that you don't think that you can help anymore. Maybe someone else can. So someone with more product or service knowledge, is there someone you could consult? If you have one, consult an organisational chart to find out what to do next. Choose the right person who can help resolve the problem you have and you must direct this to the right person otherwise you're going to be in back to square one with your problem. And be specific about what the problem is and how it needs resolving. Offer solutions. Customer and your employer will always like their staff to offer solutions to problems wherever possible and follow up your customer's needs. If someone else has taken over, taken it over, find out what is going on and follow this up for your customer. It shows that more people are dealing with the problem and therefore it looks more professional. Your assignment question is asking you for question five to explain when and to whom to escalate problems. So, for example, when a decision is needed that's outside the limits of authority, when a customer requests something that's outside the limits of responsibility, you're going to need to report this up. When dealing with complaints or problems that are outside the limits of your authority, when a member of staff does not have enough experience, knowledge or skill to be able to do something on their own, who do you report this to? A team leader or supervisor? more experienced member of the team. Maybe someone from a different team who understands the issue. Other managers, a staff helpline or help desk and subject specialists. Further reading can be found on pages 16 to 17 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. Different methods used to measure the effectiveness of your customer service delivery. There are different ways in which your effectiveness can be measured when you deliver customer service, so it's important to understand the limitations of each method and rarely would your performance be based solely on any one of those in isolation. Generally, employers will utilise the following methods to gauge your performance. So you may have seen customer feedback. Peer feedback in your department, such as 360 feedback, 
and performance reviews, whether it be quarterly, half annually or annually performance reviews. So it's worth remembering that highly motivated staff are a business asset because these staff have higher productivity rates. They have better organizational performance. They produce excellent customer service and good organizational reputation follows with highly motivated staff. And they have the ability to attract top candidates for employment because people look towards the business and see that all their staff are highly motivated and want to join them. And they bring financial stability for the company and therefore they bring a confidence to forward plan because they know the company is going to thrive. So question six is asking you to describe methods of measuring your own effectiveness in the delivery of customer service. So think back to some of the other areas we've just been talking about, but don't forget listening to feedback from your colleagues in methods such as 360 feedback, gaining feedback from your line manager, maybe in the form of appraisals or weekly meetings, reviewing sales targets and analyzing results, reading customer complaint and listening to customer feedback. Further reading can be found on pages 18 to 19 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. In this section, we will look at understand the relationship between customer service and a brand. And to do that, we will explain the importance of a brand to an organization. Explain how a brand affects an organization's customer service offer. Explain the importance of using customer service language that supports a brand promise. And identify their own role in ensuring that a brand promise is delivered. The importance of a brand to an organization. Brand differentiates from other products or services. The customers know what to expect. It brings customer loyalty. If you look at some of the brands there, McDonald's, BMW, Levi, Visa, Coca-Cola, Lego, they make the organization memorable and an air of familiarity. And these brands increases an organization's profile and value. Well, what is it in a name? Take our name, Solutions Equinox Training Solutions. Some of our customers think Solutions is Latin and ask what it means. It is not Latin, but it's memorable and a play on words for solutions. Equinox. Equinox suggests a new beginning, which it was for the founders of the company. And online learning, this title shows that the business has an online and real world presence. There is another version of this logo. The use of dark blue denotes the company's origins in policing. This globe features an, an alignment and this is repeated. This denotes our founding strapline, aligning your training needs. This is an abbreviated version of our full logo and it's used in various forms on our products. In fact, you can see one on the bottom left of this screen. And our other company color is gray, and this is featured on all our products and documents, and the color is modern and contemporary. Your assignment question is asking you for question seven to explain the importance of a brand to an organization. So the brand image reflects an organization's image and it forms a major part of an organization's identity. It establishes customer expectations of the products and services offered. Can you think of any more? And further reading can be found on pages 20 to 27 
of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. How a brand affects an organization's customer service offer. Customer service can be part of a brand. Solutions Equinox are offering as part of their brand name a solution to a customer's training needs. Tesco. In this example, Tesco are making a brand promise that every little helps. The importance of customer service language that supports a brand promise. Although Solutions Equinox may be unfamiliar to you, other well-known brands build customer trust through brand consistency. Can you think of other brands which use customer service language that supports a brand promise? So in question eight, it's asking you to explain a brand, how a brand affects an organization's customer service offer. So think about how people perceive a brand and how they, that brand can have a big influence on the service that was offered. And customer service offers should support the brand. Customers who identify with the brand are usually happy to accept customer service offers and it builds trust. And question nine is asking you to explain the importance of using customer service language that supports a brand promise. So using a language that supports the brand promise helps to establish and maintain the brand's image. Contact with staff will have a major effect on customers' impression of the brand and how they will perceive the brand promise. Using language to support the brand promise can help customers to develop and maintain a good impression of the brand. And if language was used which didn't support the brand promise, it could leave customers disappointed and skeptical about the brand promise. And further reading can be found on pages 20 to 27 of your unit handbook to help you answer these questions. Your role is vital in ensuring that a brand promise is delivered. There is very little point in a company promising to deliver a high quality service to its customers if staff do not buy into the same ethos. This is a complex subject as it links into many aspects which are not covered in this particular qualification. However, to summarize some of the factors which contribute to this particular subject, what motivates employees? It's worthwhile looking at Abraham Maslow's theory on this particular subject. Are employees sufficiently motivated? Do they have sufficient pay? Is there a recognition reward uh, award system? Do they have sufficient training and support? How loyal are employees to their employers? And does the employee understand the strategic direction of the company and the part they play in delivering this? And this is important. This is why annual appraisals or half annually appraisals should have objectives set for personal agenda that are in line with the company organizations or certainly the team's objectives in order to strive the strategic direction of the company. And once these points have been established, the key question can be asked. How are you responsible for representing the organization by fulfilling each of the promises made to customers? Team leaders need to work with their team members to make sure that they are clear about what the brand promise is and that they understand what the brand means to the organization that they follow the organization's procedures about how to deliver the brand promise. They have thorough and up-to-date knowledge about the brand and all of the related products and services. So for products and services, treat each customer as an individual. 
use appropriate customer service language and remember to take appropriate follow-up actions and keep promises and escalate any problems or issues as soon as possible so that the brand is not compromised. Question 10 is asking you to identify your own role in ensuring that a brand promise is delivered. So team leaders need to work out with their team members to make sure that they are clear about a, what a brand promise is, to understand what the brand means to the organization and follow the organization's procedures about how to deliver the brand promise. Treat each customer as an individual. Use appropriate customer service language and remember to take appropriate follow-up actions and keep promises. And escalate any problems or issues as soon as possible so that your brand is not compromised. Further reading can be found on pages 27 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. In this section, we will look at understand the resolution of customer service problems. And to do that, we will describe an organization's customer service and complaints procedures. Describe techniques to identify customer service problems and their causes. Describe techniques to deal with situations where customers become agitated or angry. Explain the limits of their own authority for resolving customers' problems and making promises. Explain the purpose of encouraging customers to provide feedback. And describe methods used to encourage customers to provide feedback. customer service and complaints procedures are there currently in place in your organisation? Complaints and customer services procedures may differ between different sectors and their structures and they may follow a set process. For example, the training industry tends to have an appeals process for learners to challenge grades or assessment decisions that are made by assessors this process tends to be structured on a tiered basis with appeals being heard at various levels until a resolution is found or a decision is made. Learners may ultimately formulate a complaint to either a qualification awarding body or, where applicable, to Ofsted. The customer service and appeals process is made clear to learners when they enrol on a training qualification and Training providers must demonstrate that the system is robust and fair before being able to deliver qualifications. Question 11 is asking you to describe your organization's customer service and complaints procedure. If you have not started your placement yet, please research one for the sector you will be joining. And further reading can be found on pages 28 to 30 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. Techniques to help identify customer service problems and their causes. Problems and causes can be identified by tracking information from customer feedback and complaints. This relies on feedback being sought and systems being in place to capture this information. Feedback from staff who encounter the problems or deal with customers. This relies on organisations being able to seek out and capture feedback from staff. There also needs to be an environment where staff feel able to share this information. Comments. Returned and rejected goods there is a need to capture valuable information concerning returned goods in order to analyse the data. Internal audit and monitoring records. These systems need to ex exist to capture this data. External reports from suppliers, internal and external stakeholders. Legal action, learning from legal processes. And customer surveys, 
reviews and forum comments. Although they do not give a full picture, they are valuable. And many forums these days and reviews are found on platforms such as Facebook and Twitter. Question 12 is asking you to describe techniques to identify customer service problems and their causes. So problems and causes can be identified by tracking information from customer feedback and complaints. Feedback from staff who encounter the problems or deal with customers comments. Returned and rejected goods. Internal audit and monitoring records. External reports. Legal action customer surveys, reviews and forum comments. And further reading can be found on pages 31 to 32 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. Techniques for dealing with customers who become agitated or angry. Safety first. Never place yourself in situations where there is danger to other customers, yourself or other staff members. Only if it is safe to do so, consider the following techniques. Number one, de-escalate the situation by offering to move somewhere quiet. Number two, always allow yourself an escape route and alert other staff members of where you are. Number three, speak clearly to avoid further antagonising the person. Use open questions, TEDs and 5WH, so tell me, explain to me, describe to me, show me, and 5WH, who, when, what, where, why, and how. Use active listening skills, show that you really are listening and paying attention. Show empathy, and give the customer your full attention. They want to, want to know that you care about the situation they are in. And apologise where appropriate and explain the reasons for the issue of problems. Number eight, explore solutions to resolve the, to resolve the issue. Number nine, agree follow up actions and ensure that you carry them out. Forcing or competing as an alternative. Smoothing or accommodating. Compromise and if necessary withdraw or avoid. If they've taken a personal disliking to you it may be better to have somebody else resolve the problem and collaborate with each other in order to solve this problem and collaborate with your colleagues. So, question 13 is asking you to describe techniques to deal with situations where customers become agitated or irate. When dealing with angry or agitated customers, the first thing to do is to make sure that the angry customer does not pose a threat to the personal safety of the staff member their colleagues, customers or other people. If there's no immediate threat, staff should deal with the angry customer followed by general techniques such as offering to move somewhere quiet and defuse the situation, using active listening skills, open questions, apologise and explain the reasons for the problem or issue. Show empathy and give the customer full attention using active listening skills and other conflict management techniques include a win-win situation where you as a company and as a person wins and so does the customer by forcing or competing, smoothing or accommodating and compromising. And can you think of any others? Further reading can be found on pages 32 to 34 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. Limits of your authority for resolving customer problems and making promises. Remember, as we stated earlier on, you may wish to go the extra mile to give good customer service. However, remember, know what offers, if any, you are authorised to make. Remember, are you authorised to make those promises? 
Don't overpromise. Don't promise what you cannot deliver. Know that you can deliver on what it is you are offering. And this is basic good customer service. And as I stated earlier on, keep your customers informed. This is basic good customer service. Let your customers know about changes or updates that are order. Give the customer regular updates to let them know that you are working on their issue. Follow through on your actions. And apologise. And as I stated earlier on, this is basic good customer service. You represent the company, the department. So therefore apologise for any mistakes made by your company. And fully understand the organization's terms and offers. Remember, are you authorised to make those promises? Your assignment question is asking you for question 14 to explain the limits of your authority for resolving customers' problems and making promises. Please use your own role to answer this question. If you're still waiting to start your placement, please research this base question based on the role that you will be doing. And further reading can be found on pages 34 to 35 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. Why do you think customer feedback is so valuable to an organisation? Knowledge is power, as they say. Organisations rely on data and information collected from customer feedback to review product lines or services with a view to improving them or introducing new ones. To see what changes are needed. To find out what is working. To find out what is not working and to find the most effective and successful ways of handling queries and complaints. And this makes sure that customers feel valued. And it makes sure that they are complying with relevant legislation and regulations. Towards the end of these qualifications, we will also ask for your feedback so you can see how your learning journey has taken place and any recommendations or changes you would make and we act upon those to find out what is working, to find out what is not working, and to find the most effective and successful way of handling queries and complaints. And we like to make sure that you feel valued, and we like to see what changes are needed. Question 15 is asking you to explain the purpose of encouraging customers to provide feedback. So remember what we've just covered to see what changes are needed, to find out what is working, find out what is not working, to find the most effective and successful ways of handling queries and complaints, and making sure that the customers feel valued, to make sure that they are complying with relevant legislation and regulations. And further reading can be found on pages 36 to 38 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. Some methods used to encourage customers to provide feedback. Talk to your customers while serving them. This is a good source of information. However, how can this be captured by the organisation and how accurate is it? Through questionnaires and surveys. This is also a good source of data and information. However, how accurate is the data and how do you encourage customers to complete them? Some companies will have an award. If they complete the survey, they enter into a prize draw and they could win vouchers or a holiday. And that's a way of encouraging them or maybe a percentage off um, a, a product or service. Comments or suggestion cards. And this is a good source of information, but how do you encourage your customers to take the time to complete them? Feedback forms. This is a good source of information. However, how do you encourage customers to complete these and how accurate are they? 
focus groups. This is a good source of information, however, there are challenges to make these reflective of customer targets in the real world. Social media. This is a good source of information, however, as we've seen many times in the past, they do attract comments from people with agendas or an axe to grind. The two big questions you should perhaps consider are how do you incentivize customers to give feedback? How accurate is the data and information? Question 16 is asking you to describe three methods used to encourage customers to provide feedback. So think about talking to customers while serving them, questionnaires, surveys, comments or suggestion cards, feedback forms, focus groups, social media. Think of the pros, the cons, the issues surrounding the capturing of the information, whether or not it's accurate. And further reading can be found on pages 36 to 38 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. In this section, we will look at understand the principles of effective team working. And to do that, we will outline the benefits of effective team working, describe how to give feedback constructively, explain conflict management techniques that may be used to resolve team conflicts, explain the importance of giving team members the opportunity to discuss work progress and any issues arising, and explain the importance of warning colleagues of problems and changes that may affect them. different types of teams within business. The types of teams that there are in business are strategic teams, management teams, operational teams, functional teams, cross-functional teams that work across departments, contract project teams, virtual teams, matrix teams, and self-managed and task force. Can you research and find out what these teams are? The purposes of teams are they have a common purpose and objective and they're designed and brought and introduced to increase productivity and reduce and increase quality. In many cases they are a support system such as customer service and they're designed to have continuous improvement and to bring in new initiatives and ideas. Dr. Meredith Belbin talked about nine team roles and they are the resource investigator, team worker, coordinator, plant, monitor evaluator, specialist, shaper, implementer and the complete finisher. Every team should feature one of these roles. Dr. Meredith Belbin talked about the resource investigator. The resource investigator gives a team a rush of enthusiasm at the start of the project by vigorously pursuing contacts and opportunities. They use their inquisitive nature to find ideas to bring back to the team. They're outgoing enthusiastic, they explore opportunities and develop contacts. They might be over optimistic and can lose interest once the initial enthusiasm has passed, so don't be surprised to find that they might forget to follow up on a lead. The team worker acts as the oil between the cogs that keeps the machine that is the team running smoothly. They help the team gel, using their versatility to identify the work required and complete it on behalf of the team. They're cooperative, perceptive and diplomatic. They listen and avert friction. They can be indecisive in crunch situations and tend to avoid confrontation. So don't be surprised to find that they might be hesitant to make unpopular decisions. The coordinator. 
The coordinator is a likely candidate for the chairperson of the team, since they have a talent for stepping back to see the big picture. They're needed to focus on the team's objectives, draw out team members and delegate work appropriately. They're mature, confident and they identify talent and they clarify goals. They can be seen as manipulative and might offload their own share of work. So don't be surprised to find that they might over-delegate, leaving themselves little work to do. The plant. Now the plant, plants are creative, unorthodox and generators of ideas. If an innovative solution to a problem is needed, a plant is a good person to ask. They're also known as an innovator. They tend to be highly creative and good at solving problems in unconventional ways. Creative, imaginative, free thinking. They generate ideas and solve difficult problems. But they might ignore the incidentals and may be too preoccupied to communicate effectively. So don't be surprised to find that they could be absent-minded or forgetful. The monitor evaluator are fair and logical observers and judges of what is going on in the team. They provide a logical eye, making impartial judgments where required, and weighs up the team's options in a dispassionate way. They're sober, strategic and discerning. They see all options and judges accurately. Sometimes they lack the drive and ability to inspire others and can be overcritical. So don't be surprised to find that they could be slow to come to decisions. The specialist. Specialists are passionate about learning in their own particular field. They bring in-depth knowledge of a key area to the team. They're single-minded, self-starting and dedicated. They provide a specialist knowledge and skills. They tend to contribute on a narrow front and can dwell on the technicalities, so don't be surprised to find that they overload you with information. The Shaper. The Shaper is a task-focused individual who pursues objectives with vigour and who is driven by tremendous energy and the need to achieve. They provide the necessary drive to ensure that the team keeps moving and does not lose focus or momentum. They're challenging, dynamic and they thrive on pressure. They have the drive and courage to overcome obstacles. They can be prone to provocation and may sometimes offend people's feelings, so don't be surprised to find that they could risk becoming aggressive and bad-humoured in their attempts to get things done. The Implementer the implementer takes their colleagues' suggestions and ideas and turns them into positive action. The implementer or company worker are needed to plan a workable strategy and to carry it out as efficiently as possible. They're practical, reliable, efficient, and they turn ideas into actions and organise work that needs to be done. They can be a bit inflexible and slow to respond to new possibilities, so don't be surprised to find that they might be slow to relinquish their plans in favour of positive change. And finally, the completer finisher. The completer finisher is a perfectionist and will often go the extra mile to make sure that everything is just right and the things that they deliver can be trusted to have been double checked and then checked again. They're most effectively used at the end of tasks to polish and scrutinise the work for errors, subjecting it to the highest standards of quality and control. They're painstakingly conscientious and anxious, searching out for errors, polishing and perfecting. But they can be inclined to unduly worry and reluctant to delegate because they're terrified of giving their work to someone who might mess it up. So don't be surprised to find that they could be accused of taking their perfectionism to extremes. So the benefits of effective team working are you have increased productivity, increased profitability, you develop trust, everyone knows their role and what others expect of them. It delivers a high standard of product and or service, follows the organization's policies and procedures, 
delivers the project on time and in budget, provides support, and it's good for career development. Question 17 is asking you to outline the benefits of effective team working. So think about individuals, teams and organisations. So individuals may feel proud to be associated with a successful and effective team. They may feel supported when tackling tasks or learning new skills, feeling secure and confident where other team members' knowledge and skills and experience, opportunities for creativity and career development, and it increases motivation and they feel valued. With teams, they're working towards shared objectives. Team members who are flexible and able to do several tasks brings a balanced and supported environment. Brings together expertise of team members for the benefit of the whole team. For the organisation, a successful achievement of organisation objectives. Access to a wide range of talents and strengths within the workforce. Good internal communications, increased efficiency and less duplication of work. More flexible workplace. Better relationships with customers and better relationships. Further reading can be found on pages 40 to 43 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. The importance of giving constructive feedback. Giving feedback is not just reserved for managers or supervisors. So how do you give constructive feedback? Well, identify the issue straight away and provide specific feedback about the problem. Don't go around the bushes. Go straight to it. Use open body language. Be welcoming. Be warm and don't be cold with arms folded and frowning. Give the feedback as soon as possible after the event and give feedback often so it doesn't come as a surprise to somebody. Always give the person a chance to respond. Give suggestions on how they may want to improve or ask how they think that they could improve. Review it and always show support. Feedback can be given in different ways. There's formal or informal feedback, such as a disciplinary or just a quick chat. It can be done verbally, as in spoken. It can be written in the form of feedback documents or a formal letter. Qualitative, such as collection of data. Or quantitative. It's not always easy to give feedback. However, it is important for it to be honest and constructive. Honest, telling the truth or able to be trusted and not likely to steal, cheat or lie. And constructive, useful and likely or intended to improve something. Use appropriate language to the person receiving the feedback. Don't use hostile language. Put yourself in their shoes and use the sandwich method. So be positive at the start. Give your constructive feedback in the middle and at the end give them a positive to go away with so they don't go away feeling glum. Always give them something positive to end on. So question 18 is asking you to describe how to give feedback constructively. So praise the individual or team for good aspect of their performance. Mention and explain areas that need to be improved and give guidance and support on about how to improve. Always finish on a high note about positive aspects and plans and hopes for the future developments and improvements. Have a clear purpose for giving the feedback. Respect the need for privacy and sensitivity, so don't go off telling other people. Be specific and use good questioning techniques and focus on the issue rather than the person.
and further reading can be found on pages 43 to 44 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. There will always be disagreements and some conflict with teams and some of those sources of conflict can be between individuals and groups. There may be dissatisfaction with the workload or work slippages where people are or not picking up the pace and doing what they're supposed to be doing. There could be a lack of appreciation or perceived unfairness. Misunderstandings and poor sharing of information. There are external problems that affect the team or individuals. Differences of opinion. People having different objectives. That's why it's important to ensure that everybody on the team are driving towards the same goal. Incompatible objectives and in some cases rivalry. There might be bullying, harassment or personality clashes between individuals. And how that conflict is managed is negotiation between parties. Sharing a good open communication and having understanding of the different personalities of the people on the team. Not everybody is going to get on with each other, but it's to ensure that everybody's driving towards the same goal and recognising that everybody is different. And setting non-conflicting goals so everybody's driving towards the same end. And having a clear explanation of policies and procedures especially concerning bullying and harassment. Being consistent and fair with rewarding or disciplinary. Recognising and rewarding effort for those who deserve it. And get in there early to stop anything from happening. A good manager, a good team leader spots these problems early. So in essence, forcing collaborating, withdrawing and smoothing and forcing, also known as competing, an individual firmly pursues their own concerns despite resistance from another person. This may involve pushing one viewpoint at the expense of another or maintaining firm resistance to another person's actions. So examples of when forcing may be appropriate in certain situations when all other less forceful methods don't work or ineffective when you need to stand up for your own rights, resisting aggression or pressure, and when a quick resolution is required and using force is justified. Some caveats for forcing. It may negatively affect your relationship with the opponent in the long run and may cause the opponent to react in the same way, even if the opponent did not intend to be forceful originally. It cannot take advantage of the strong sides of the other sides of position. Taking this approach may require a lot of energy. And collaborating is also known as confronting the problem or problem solving. And that's in an attempt to work with the other person to find a win-win situation to the problem at hand and the one that most satisfies the concerns of both parties. Withdrawing, also known as avoiding, this is when a person neither pursues their own concerns nor those of their opponent. They do not address the conflict, but sidesteps, postpones it, or simply withdraws. And smoothing is accommodating the concerns of other people first, rather than prioritising your own concerns. So some examples of that is when it's important to provide a temporary relief from conflict, or buy time until you're in a better position to respond or push back. But there are some caveats of that. You may be abused, there may be a risk of that because they might constantly take advantage of your tendency to try to collaborate, to accommodate and smooth. Therefore, it's important to maintain the right balance. And it makes it more difficult to transition to a win-win solution in the future because some of your supporters may not like your smoothing response and be turned off from it. Your assignment question for question 19 is asking you to explain three conflict management techniques that may be used to resolve team conflicts. Think about the win-win, collaborating, forcing or competing, smoothing or accommodating, compromising, withdrawing or avoiding. 
and further reading can be found on pages 45 to 49 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. Discuss work progression and any issues with team members too, to see if their progress aligns with managers' expectations. Deal with any questions about the work. Clear up any misunderstandings. On target for deadlines. To reduce stress. And to feel part of a team. To feel supported. Resolve issues. Have you ever felt frustrated that you have not been able to discuss the progress of your work? How did that make you feel? Did this make you feel that you weren't part of the team? Did this make you feel unsupported? Did this cause you to feel stressed? Did you feel issues remained unresolved? Question 20 is asking you to explain the importance of giving team members the opportunity to discuss work progress and any issues arising. So it's important to give team members the opportunity to discuss progress and issues so that they can discuss their progress and compare it to work schedules. To avoid misunderstandings, identify and discuss any problems, agree actions that are needed to develop their skills and working relationships and provide information to help managers with planning and privately discuss any personal issues that might be affecting their work performance and discuss their career development. Think about John Adair and what we discussed in an earlier session and how this could be the importance of giving team members the opportunity to discuss work progress and any issues arising and how with John Adair the objectives can become skewed if an individual does not feel that their skills working relationships are being developed and there are misunderstandings in their objectives or within their team agendas. Further reading can be found on pages 51 to 53 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. All change, all change. Things invariably change in our own lives for various reasons and this is equally applicable to organisations. The process of effectively managing change within organisations is often referred to as change management. Change within organisations can be as a consequence of many different reasons and some of the main ones could be as follows. Changes in technology. In this case you see the high speed train, Great Western Railway, change from these trains to a new style of high speed train because of signalling upgrades and from customer expectations wanting higher demand which meant more trains in a shorter space, which meant they needed to upgrade their systems. And these systems, these old trains, would not cope with this. To reflect what competitors are doing. The changes in the marketplace. In many cases in retail, shop rents are extremely high. So in order to offset a lot of that cost, they're moving to online many shops, and therefore you can have click and collect or online delivery. Reflecting customer expectations. Many customers these days expect next day delivery or click and collect and are surprised when companies do not provide this. New legislation, regulation, standards such as the Health and Safety at Work Act, working time directive and minimum wage requirements. Environmental factors, changes in legislation with politics. Internal business needs, cutting costs, modernisation, changes to product lines, etc. And external business factors. If you look at the COVID-19 coronavirus, many companies had to adapt. And failure to adapt resulted in the closure of many businesses. Change will impact staff in different ways, so it's important to understand and recognise this. 
And during the process of change, team members may experience the following. They may have increased levels of stress. Feelings of inadequacies. Reduced productivity accompanied by failure to achieve targets. They may suffer from reduced pay. There will be a reduction in job satisfaction. And due to streamlining, there may be a reducement of career opportunities. They may feel a lack of confidence in their team managers and leaders. It might result in conflict between team members, particularly if some are facing redundancy and others are not. There may be a loss of key team members due to staff reductions or because they choose to leave and leave to join a company that's already undergone the change. A lack of job security. They may suffer or expect a closure of an organisation or sites within their portfolio. And Kubler-Ross demonstrated this with the Kubler-Ross change curve. Now, we've looked at this before, but this is importance of warning colleagues of problems and change that may affect them. But looking quickly back at the Kubler-Ross change curve, there is a shock at the initial event or announcement of the change. So morale and competence is actually at high at this point, but it increases because there's a denial that over time that this change is going to happen to them. So they're looking for evidence that it isn't true. And then they become frustrated when they realise that the change is actually starting to occur and they become angry. And it will hit a low mood, depression, when lacking in energy, and this will affect right across the team and in some cases may result in staff walkout. And then over time, morale and competence may increase where they will, with a company, starts to experiment with new situations. And over time, a decision is made and it's learning how to work in the new situation and feeling more positive. So the change starts to occur whilst incorporating the team members that are left. And so morale and competence starts to rise again. And over time, they are integrated into the change. So morale and competence becomes high with the changes integrated. And this person comes out the other side of the Kubler-Ross change curve as a renewed individual. So help to manage change for the team by providing support. You as a team leader should manage expectations and answer staff questions and give input. Be receptive to staff voicing, con voicing concerns and don't avoid it. Give organisational training and information. Keep your staff informed. Help the change go smoothly and deal with problems quickly. By warning colleagues of change that may affect them, teams can work together to anticipate work problems and changes. They can avoid problems or stop them before they become serious. By doing this, they can share accurate information and be adequately prepared for changes. And they keep the delivery of products and services on track. Sharing and building trust between individuals and teams and make sure they understand the changes and always give and receive support. Question 21 is asking you to explain the importance of warning colleagues of problems and changes that may affect them. So if team members warn their colleagues about problems or changes that may affect them, Colleagues can work together as an effective team and anticipate work problems and changes, avoid problems or stop them before they become serious, share accurate information, prepare for changes, keep the delivery of products and services on track, share and build trust between individuals and teams and make sure they understand the changes and give and receive support. And further reading can be found on pages 51 to 53 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. In this section, 
we will look at understand how to develop working relationships with other teams and departments. And to do that, we will explain the need to develop working relationships with other teams. Identify the benefits of developing working relationships with other team members and departments. And describe ways in which working relationships with other teams and departments can be developed. And explain the potential impact of ineffective working relationships with other teams and departments. The need to develop working relationships with other teams. For organisations to achieve their strategic objectives, different departmental teams need to be able to work with one another. Benefits of developing working relationships with other teams and departments. Interdepartmental cooperation brings many benefits to the organisation and the individuals concerned, and these include sharing best practice, learning from one another, utilising experience in other teams, networking opportunities, and learning about the wider organisation, which itself is career enhancing. There's better communication skills. It brings about higher levels of trust, increases employee morale improves productivity and therefore you have lower staff turnover because your staff are happy working for you. Question 22 is asking you to explain the need to develop working relationships with other teams. So for an organisation to run smoothly and successfully, goals, people from different departments and teams have to be able to work well with one another. When teams have a good working relationship, there are many benefits for the individual and team members, the team as a whole and the organisation. And question 23 is asking you to identify the benefits of developing working relationships with other teams. Think about better communication skills, higher levels of trust, better employee morale and improved productivity and lower staff turnover. And further reading can be found on pages 54 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. Ways in which working relationships with other teams and departments can be developed. Showing respect to other teams and their staff. Offering praise to other teams and their staff. Being reliable and accountable by delivering on commitments made to other teams and their staff. Being flexible and receptive to different ways of working, timescales and being accessible. Using good communication. Potential impact of ineffective working relationships with other teams and departments. Team members may feel underappreciated and undervalued and this can lead to poor productivity and have a negative impact on staff morale. There may be conflict when members of different teams and departments don't work well together. Tempers may flare. There may be arguments and differences of opinion that make it hard for the rest of the team to work well together. Team members may leave. If an employee is unhappy, they will probably look for a new job. There is no trust. Poor working relationships don't involve trust, which is essential to a product productive working relationship. Without trust, information won't be shared, there won't be a collaborative spirit, and goals may not be achieved. Poor morale. If even two employees from different teams don't have a good working relationship, it can affect the morale of the whole office. Low morale has a huge impact on productivity. Goals won't be met. Working well with other teams is essential to ensuring that goals and targets are achieved. Ineffective working relationships can prevent goals and targets from being met.
Your assignment question for question 24 is asking you to describe ways in which working relationships with other teams and departments can be developed. And question 25 is asking you to explain the potential impact of ineffective working relationships with other teams and individuals. So remember about teams showing respect, offering praise, being reliable and accountable, being flexible and using good communication and team members may feel underappreciated and undervalued. There may be conflict. Team members may need leave. There is no trust. Poor morale or goals won't be met. And further reading can be found on page 56 of your unit handbook to help you answer these questions. This concludes the third session relating to this qualification. In the next module of this qualification, we will be covering the following topics. Introduction to coaching. Introduction to mentoring. And understand personal development. You would have been sent by email a time, date and go-to meeting link for you to log on for the teaching session which accompanies this presentation. And it's advisable that you follow and subscribe our YouTube channel to ensure you have the latest alerts to when the new material becomes available. To get the most from your learning journey, please ensure you log on to this online session with your trainer. We hope that you found this presentation useful and we encourage you to use the unit handbooks which are accessible in PDF format from your ePortfolio to support your studies. For any questions, either use the online go to support or our remote assistance service and we can be contacted at learners at solutionsequinox.com and your emails must be marked in the subject heading NCFE Leadership to avoid them becoming lost. Thank you for listening.